We all have a story to tell. Let's tell yours. Welcome to the Intellectual People Podcast with your host, Jason. Come together and listen to journey stories and more from interesting people. Welcome your host, Jason. Today on the Intellectual People Podcast, I have Dr. Robert Malone. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Very well, thank you. Robert, please tell us what you invented. Oh, that's an open and invented many things. Uh, the topic that has everybody's focus right now has to do with the core technology platform that has given rise 30 years later to these mRNA vaccines that has the world enthralled. But I, I, I have many, many patents and I have uh, a long history in published uh, peer-reviewed literature of innovating in the area of vaccine development and uh, vaccine related technology and gene delivery related technology, particularly non-viral gene delivery. So I've really been at the forefront of that for the first third of my career. And that's where the inventions have occurred. How did you get involved in medicine? That's a good question. The uh, you know, these things go back to childhood experiences, of course. That's the usual storyline that folks give for that question. In my case, uh, my father, both my father and my father-in-law were deep in uh, defense industry. In, they're both engineers, uh, both were mentors, both made major contributions uh, to the defense industry. Uh, my father-in-law ran Raytheon Special Projects Division, which is basically their spook shop. Uh, and he went back to the avionics for the SR-71. Uh, and beyond that, in World War II, he was right at the forefront of the development of radar technology. Mm -hmm. My dad developed uh, high energy systems was what he was focused on. And that has to do with uh, low inductance capacitors that are very hardened that they use for the bunker bombs and exploding bridge wire and exploding foil, which is the technology that's currently used for um, uh, triggering thermonuclear devices because it's very precise. So I came, I came from that background of being the son of engineers, uh, for better or worse, and, uh, and the son also of a teacher. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, English teacher is you can my language skills. And and they both, my mother in particular, wanted me to go into medicine. I rebelled against that mm. um, in my as in my youth. Uh, and for a while, I was a farmhand and a carpenter and those kinds of things. Growing up in the central coast of California, um, in Santa Barbara area, and then uh, I I went back to school and. Uh, became very embedded in computer science. This is 1980 to 1982. Graduated from a community college in Santa Barbara with a uh, associate degree in computer science and multiple certificates, uh, you know, best computer science student and that kind of stuff. But I, I had just gotten tired of working in a basement, looking at a monitor and having my interactions just just digital with with the uh, with the system and the software and the programming code and everything else and so i i decided well i did want to go into this hot new area of biotechnology called molecular biology and uh um uh didn't want to spend the rest of my life sitting in front of a computer screen in a room with no windows. So I like to say that now I still sit in front of a computer screen all day long in a room often with no windows, but I make about a third of what I had made if I had stayed on the computer track uh, that I'd started in the early 1980s. Uh, I mean, we still had some punch card stuff that we did in, as part of the training back then. So just to give you some time frame, sure. uh, uh, you know, the, I, my dad actually built a, uh, um, a kit uh, computer uh, back, you know, when I, in those days. Uh, so, so I, I do have this kind of span and the computer science taught me logic in a really rigorous way. I think it's one of the things that makes me different from a lot of 
my fellow physicians is having had that logic experience. So I went to UC Davis, I transferred to UC Davis, couldn't get into Berkeley, uh, you know, so, so there it is. Uh, sure. um, but I had this farming background and that fit with the logic of UC Davis. And I was married. Uh, my wife and I were uh, high school sweethearts. Uh, we, we kind of eloped to the uh, mountains uh, below Lake Tahoe for a while before I went back to school. Uh, so we were uh, very much a couple. And uh, so returned to UC Davis and just became passionately embedded in, uh, in the development of uh, technology relating to medicine. And in particular, my mother was afraid of breast cancer. She was just frightfully afraid of breast cancer. And I had an opportunity I, as, as a, a, a new uh, third year student at Davis, I had the opportunity to do rotations as an undergraduate. And okay. uh, so I found this advertisement for a pathology lab that was working on breast cancer that was doing molecular virology. And that's kind of was the pivot point. Hmm. Uh, I went to work for a, a, a senior pathologist named Robert Cardiff. He actually wrote a letter of recommendation to me recently for the, uh, the big prize committee. Um, I was told I needed to put a letter in. So he's, he's been a long-standing mentor. He's a very severe gentleman, uh, notorious for that. I remember my interview with him, and he's, he's, I was trying to be deferential and, and, um, and circumspect, and he, and he turned to me, looked straight in the eye, and he said, I have no time for false modesty. <laughs> uh, and I was like, whoa, okay, you're no longer in Kansas anymore, Robert. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, but he took me on, and it was a, the, the, he had just come off of a sabbatical with the Bishop and Varmus lab. Uh, who had received the Nobel Prize for Oncogenes. And the chairman of the department at the time was a character, really a true character named Murray Gardner, who uh, had been the founder of the USC Cancer Center and had been recruited to run the Department of Pathology at Davis uh, by enticing him. Uh, Bob Cardiff told me this story the other day. I'd never known it before. They were trying to recruit Murray to head up the department, and they didn't have enough money to do it. And so they asked him, what is it that he really wanted? And, and he said, Alice, his wife, really wants a red barn in a pond. <laughs> and, and so they scurried about and they found some rural property around UC Davis that had a red barn in a, in a <laughs> pond. And by God, that did the trick. Uh, so right. Murray, Murray was really a character. Uh, he, had, he had been uh, mentored uh, Early on, after you know, he came back from World War II, he played an early role in the war on cancer, and uh, was busy doing crazy things down, both first on the East Coast and then at USC, where they would do stuff like uh, um, isolate viruses from chicken tumors and and try to isolate them from tree tumors and all kinds of things. Wow. Uh, and uh, so, so I I entered this laboratory environment naively with just driven passion to learn molecular biology and to get into the mainstream of this new technology space. And at the time I had, there was, it was, um, medical school was an impossible dream. Uh, it was so insanely competitive back then to get in gotcha. anywhere. And, uh, so I, I and, and I was a, what they call a bent arrow. I wasn't a straight arrow, you know, going, you know, yeah. uh, fast track for everything. And uh, so I thought my, my prospects were poor, but if I became a good biochemist and molecular biologist, well, that would be an okay fallback if I didn't get in. <laughs> and, and so that was the, the thinking was kind of risk mitigation in education. And, and I just... I just grabbed onto it and, and became passionate in the laboratory, spent every moment I could outside of my uh, coursework, you know, just incredibly long hours, both in the lab and 
and around learning molecular biology and biochemistry, which at UC Davis was a tough, tough road. I mean, it's not chemical engineering, but it's just a notch sure. below it. So this led me, the breast cancer work was with mouse mammary tumor virus, which is a retrovirus model of breast cancer in mice. Okay. That allowed one to ask questions about oncogenes and eventually tumor suppressor genes, et cetera. And I became the worker bee to do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of isolating DNA and RNA from a variety of different cell types and tumors and working with this uh, wild mouse colony that didn't get breast cancer very frequently because it only had a, it didn't have any native uh, mouse memory tumor virus, which is very odd. Hmm. And uh, so I just learned the craft and it was at a time frame when sequencing, you know, dideoxy sequencing, which much of the technology had also been developed at UC Davis, strangely, uh, was getting off the ground. And northern blots and southern blots were the uh, main stem of, of that uh, technology space at the time. Uh, that's all obsolete now. Everybody just sequences things or does PCR. And I, and I had to make the everything. I had to make the radioactive probes. I had to do the whole kit caboodle and became quite good at it. I was a little bit OCD. I guess I still am. And, uh, and I, and I did really well in the lab. And, uh, in a way I learned more in that laboratory over the next two years, both about science politics and about working uh, with nucleic acids than I did ever since. It really created the foundation. And they just let me at it. They treated me like I was a graduate student. And so a series of things happened in that lab. It was just being the right place at the right time, which I guess is kind of my story overall, is uh, being in the right place at the right time. Or my wife says, I should say, chance favors the prepared mind. But uh, the Davis lab, uh, there was the Davis Pathology Lab was affiliated with the California Regional Primate Research Center. And the research center had this colony of non-human primates that had an immunodeficiency syndrome that Murray recognized as being similar to the immunodeficiency syndrome being observed in uh, male homosexuals, particularly in San Francisco, which is just down the road from Davis. And so it, it turned out that Preston Marks and Murray made the, f and others in the lab, including the uh, um, electron microscopist played a key role, made the first observations of retroviruses being involved in an immunodeficiency syndrome in a non-human primate. It was published in Lancet. And that was all happening around me. I, I was getting rigorously grueled on a weekly basis about my, you know, the positive controls and negative controls and what's the hypothesis and blah, 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 blah. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, this thing happened. And at the time, I remember still interviewing for my MD uh, you know, acceptance into medical school, I would, I would, it was, it was absolutely known as a lesson in medicine and group think. Everybody knew that AIDS was caused by semen getting in the blood and the abuse of amyl nitrate. And so I would walk into these interviews saying, no, 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 it's a retrovirus. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, that's the way that goes. So, so, uh, Murray, in Preston had this observation with others and, and found this retrovirus in the macaque tissue. And then there was this guy at the Pasteur Institute that said he had found the actual virus that was causing it in humans. His name was Luc Montagnier. And uh, if you've ever seen the, the HBO video when the band played on, there's a, a series of scenes where Bob Gallo and others travel from the U.S. to visit the pastor and visit Luc mm -hmm. Montagnier. Well, Murray was one of the guys on that trip. And uh, Murray uh, came back, and I'll never forget, he almost dancing down the hall, coming back into the laboratory, saying, I have the virus that causes AIDS in my pocket. 
So he brought it through customs, you know, with no paperwork or anything, right. uh, in a in a in a Eppendorf tube, and uh, that was that was uh, how the lab got that reagent, and mm -hmm. then that set in play a whole cascade of things, uh, having to do with uh, um, Bob Gallo, and uh, hardball politics. Uh, just um, Murray tried to set up a a large BSL-3, so high containment laboratory for doing the AIDS research in the monkeys. And uh, the local community got in a big uproar over that and the risks associated with it. And Bob Gallo, I, I clearly remember, Bob Gallo called Murray and threatened him that he would never get another grant unless he stopped working with the French virus and started working with the American virus, which is the one that Actually, it turns out Bob Gallo had snitched from Luc Montagnier. It's a, that's another long story. Mm -hmm. So, so I got to see hardball politics front and center. Uh, the the polit you know people people think that science, and I used to think that uh, science was this elegant exchange between intellectuals, as we're trying to have now, right. and and it's all about the truth and honesty and integrity. No, it's about money and power. Uh, and and at the top level, you know, for folks right. like us, you and me that are more kind of in the middle tier, uh, it's it's not, it's a different thing. But at the top yes. tier, it is about money and power and fame and immortality and all that stuff. Hmm. So, uh, so I came out of this uh, intensive, uh, opportunity in a small sheltered laboratory at, in a in a little bit of a backwater environment UC Davis but it's technically at the front edge right and um, and I was accepted into an MD PhD program with a full scholarship at Northwestern in Chicago uh, which my wife will never forgive me for we were both from Santa Barbara and we had no idea what Chicago winners meant uh, and so after two years of that, she was like, I can't stand this anymore. We got to get out of Dodge. And uh, so, uh, you know, um, as they say, a happy wife is a happy life. And the converse is also true. Uh, so uh, I applied for graduate school and, um, and I was taken in. I, I really wanted to do gene therapy using retroviruses. I thought that was the thing that would allow me to use my knowledge base and passion for retroviruses and understanding of retroviral biology. And, and this is what I, I thought that the gene therapy, the concept of Ted Friedman, uh, that gene therapy using retroviruses was, was going to be, go mainstream. And uh, there would be gene therapists in every hospital. And I thought, okay, well, I could be at the forefront of this new specialty. Cool. <laughs> um, and so that was the strategy. And you know, and, and reeling back, you know, I had, I had gone up this uh, risk mitigated uh, triage thing, and then suddenly found myself with a full scholarship for an MD PhD, which I never would have expected back then. Right. Um, so here we were, and uh, Jill was not happy after two years in Chicago, uh, and I did my GREs, and I just knocked it out of the park which is not surprising after, you know, you've come out of this pressure cooker and, and, you know, in, uh, in terms of my education at UC Davis and then two years of medical school. Uh, and, uh, so my scores were basically off the chart. So I could pretty much go wherever I wanted for graduate school and UC Davis was, I mean, UC San Diego had Ted Friedman and Inder Verma at the Salk Institute who were two of the leading retroviral gene therapists in the world. Ted Friedman has actually come up with the whole idea of gene therapy. So that was the ticket. I was going to go there and I was going to bring, you know, really become a hardcore virologist and, and uh, particularly with this application in mind. And uh, so we traveled down to San Diego in an old uh, Cadillac. That was a trip, uh, <laughs> quite literally. And uh, uh, with a baby, um, at the time, our first son, that had been born at the beginning of my second, uh, really at the end of my first year of medical school. And uh, so uh, down to San Diego, did my initial rotations and uh, 
Ted Friedman told me that um, he would not take me into his laboratory to work on retroviral gene therapy, largely because he thought it was a dead field. And uh, it had been frustrating and it, things hadn't worked out for him. Mm. And he, he said that what I could do <clears throat> was come on, if I wanted to build an ordered cosmid library of one of the human chromosomes, which I'd done enough sequencing to know that was gonna be just like watching the paint dry. Uh, it was going to just be <laughs> deadly. And that's another one of those fork in the road where I probably blew it. Because if I had taken that opportunity, I would have been at the forefront of the Human Genome Project. Mm -hmm. It's dumb. Um, but uh, this is the way life is. That's um, right. You, you pick your choices and, and it happens. So, uh, so I, Ted Friedman wouldn't take me in unless I worked on basically the forefront of the Genomics Project. And I was really strongly warned by some faculty at UC San Diego, which is right across the street from the Salk. So the Salk is on the cliffs of La Jolla and on um, Torrey Pines Road and, and UCSD uh, main campus is just across the street. And then all of the big, uh, what's now become a biotech giant hub uh, further down Torrey Pines Road towards the golf course, most of that didn't exist. There was a couple companies. And there was scripts. So uh, so I was really warned not to go to Ender for a variety of reasons, not all of some of which were just kind of only sideways alluded to. Uh, and uh, it, it was known to be an insanely competitive cutthroat postdoctoral laboratory where postdocs, the, you know, in, in these big postdoc labs these days, one of the strategies is to, to put multiple postdoctoral students on the same project and make them compete against each other within the same laboratory, which creates uh, dynamics that are just not healthy. I'm uh, sure. <laughs> people stealing each other's data and reagents and sneaking in at night and everybody gets paranoid and it's just crazy. That is crazy. And uh, so I, I, uh, I went to this, I Inder took me in versus a rotation student and then as a graduate student, and I was the only graduate student in a postdoc lab of about 18 or 19 people. The senior postdoc, uh, Dinko Valerio, went on to create a company called Crucell. And Crucell got sold to J&J, &J, and that's the basis of the J&J &J vaccine. So mm -hmm. this all kind of threads, you'll see this threads back yeah. historically to this time when I was in Inder's lab and, and at UCSD between 87 and 89. So that's what, that's what kind of my origin story is in terms of bringing us up to the point where the discoveries started to happen. Uh, so I've set the stage and, and why did I go into medicine and what was my passion and, and the vision and all that kind of stuff. So if you can, Robert, how, what was the process of the mRNA basis? How did that come about in the lab in what, 1986 to 1988, somewhere in that time frame? 87 to 89. 87 to 89. And uh, so, so it was a series of stacked discoveries that probably couldn't have happened in any other place. Uh, it was uh, very much a series of, of events where I, I encountered key technologies and applied them to suit my uh, needs and, and my focus. Uh, when, and it loops back a little bit to Davis, with, with Murray Gardner and uh, Preston Marks and the non-human primate discovery and the early days of AIDS, the initial focus was on vaccines and developing a vaccine and that was Murray's passion for good reason, and that of Preston and the Primate Center. And so I had already been steeped in vaccine technology, and I'd done a rotation as a graduate, as a, you know, during the summertime at Northwestern with Bob Lamb, who is an influenza virologist of considerable note. So I was familiar with uh, influenza molecular biology and, and vaccinology, and then also very familiar with the forefront of vaccine development with uh, the AIDS 
uh, agent, let's say LIV, HTV03, HIV. And uh, so, so I landed in this laboratory and what one has to do as a graduate student is come up with something that is obs both obscure enough and significant enough that uh, you're, you're gonna have space to develop your thing and some original knowledge, but you're not just gonna get bowled over by the big boys that uh, are gonna compete with you. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's um, you know, you have to thread the lock a little bit. And one of the big issues with the retroviral vectors was how they are assembled and packaged. And in particular, what's called the um, uh, packaging sequence, which is at the front end of the retroviral RNA. That, just to um, recap, <coughs> what makes a retrovirus retro is not that it was discovered in the 60s, but rather uh, that the central dogma of biology is that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. So it goes in one direction, DNA, RNA, protein. Okay. Um, and a retrovirus is, a, is one example of an agent which refutes that dominant paradigm. It was discovered that retroviruses, although they're RNA viruses, they exist in the genome of uh, those that it infects, including us, as DNA. Well, that's a paradox. Um, how does that happen? It's, it's as a virus particle, it's RNA, so it's transmitted as an RNA virus, and yet it becomes DNA somehow hmm. and, and is found in the genome of uh, the animals that it infects. So that problem was solved by various people, including a guy named David Baltimore, for which he received the Nobel Prize. Uh, the uh, gentleman that worked as a postdoc in David Baltimore's lab to characterize that enzyme called reverse transcriptase that makes RNA back into DNA. Hmm. So it's reverse transcriptase, was a, a young Indian that had come from uh, one of the top Israeli uh, PhD programs named Inder Verma. And so Inder was the guy that I was going to work for. So he was not just a gene therapy guy. He was uh, one of the top people in the world in control of gene expression and uh, in the fundamentals of retroviruses. <clears throat> so. So one of the key problems was that uh, there were these cell lines that had a proteins from a retrovirus that would complement a defect in a retrovirus genome. So that's how this system works. The same thing basically happens with the adenoviral vectors like for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So gene therapy technology fundamentals uh, in, in the case of the retros, the, the molecule that gets packaged, assembled as a retrovirus, is an RNA, and there is a specific part of that RNA that directs the machinery of the other retrovirus proteins to package it into a final virus particle. <laughs> and that uh, had been defined vaguely but not precisely, and, and information about how that worked was not really known. So I thought, and it involved RNA structure and folding, complicated stuff that's still hard to solve. And so that's what I was, I decided to work on, was how does RNA get packaged and what are the specific sequences in the packaging sequence domain that are responsible for that? And how is so, that done, Robert? So that, it, it had never been done. <laughs> um, right. and, and so to get there, I had to build some fundamental technology to allow me to ask the questions. Okay. And uh, so that I set about to try to work on how to uh, do this process. And the logic was simplistic and, and naive. Uh, other, there are RNA viruses like polio that you can purify polio virus and put it on cells and, you know, just scratch the cells, do almost nothing. Hmm. And it will, you know, a, a little bit of that RNA will get into the virus, into the cell 
and it'll produce live poliovirus. Okay, so poliovirus RNA is infectious. Retrovirus RNA is not. Hmm. So the question was, can you get enough retrovirus RNA into a cell, a packaging cell that has all of the proteins necessary to assemble a retrovirus and cause that to yield virus particles right. that would be infectious? Yeah. So in order to do this, I had to develop a system for efficiently delivering RNA, and there were none that were very efficient at all. Hmm. And uh, so that required um, that I build a system that would allow me to test new methods and develop new methods for delivering RNA into cells. So the system that I built was based on a reporter gene that had just, this is a gene that's used a, a genetic sequence that produces a protein okay. that can be readily assayed in a sensitive linear uh, assay. That's the ideal, okay? Uh, and the technology that everyone was using at the time was called chloramphenicol acetyl transferase. And it required a radioactive uh, tagged reaction followed by thin layer chromatography. So this is biochemistry talk. But the bottom line was it was really kludgy. You, you could, you know, people published on a single assay, you know, you'd have a single assay and some controls. There would be no statistics. There would be no solid quantitation. But this is how things were done with chloramphenicol acetyl transferase. And it was radioactive and messy. And, <laughs> oh, it's just a horrible thing. Sure. And, uh, you know, it would take two to three days because you'd have to expose a film to it. And I had just finished a rotation before I went into Inder's lab with this guy, Suresh Subramani, uh, who had developed and just published a whole new reporter gene system. Mm -hmm. And it, it involved the protein that makes the firefly glow which yields photons in its reaction. And so, you know, as an engineer, photomultiplier tube technology is pretty cool and, and it's highly sensitive and you can detect single photons yeah. with uh, PMTs uh, with great sensitivity. And so, so this protein that makes the firefly tail glow has the a somewhat unfortunate name of luciferase. It has nothing to do with the devil. Uh, I always have to say that for certain um, cohorts that might be listening in. It's just the name that they chose for the firefly protein. But uh, they, uh, it was, this was cloned and Suresh and his team had shown that this could be used as a reporter gene. Hmm. And there was a company in San Diego that had developed the first luminometers, which is the tool that's used to detect these photons very sensitively and characterize that. And so I, I just happened to have access to what was then uh, emerging new technology that was much, much more sensitive than chlorophenicol acetyl transferase and cost pennies an assay, was not radioactive, and I could run 100 samples if I wanted, certainly run everything in triplicate or quadruplicate and get the statistics and, and all that good stuff. And it was linear over four logs, so just an awesome assay. And sure. uh, and you can convert it back to total protein. So I had luciferase as my core that I could, I could put luciferase in as mRNA into a cell and that cell would uh, produce the protein and then I could pop that cell open, add the substrate and it would emit light and I could quantitate exactly how much protein was in there in, you know, within minutes as opposed mm. to multiple days. So that was cool. That was a core part of the technology. And then um, I was working with um, this protein and trying to develop this assay. And I had an opportunity to, I, I was Tony Hunter, uh, who's a brilliant uh, scientist and Nobel Prize also ran at the Salk. At the time I was there at the Salk, there was at least half a dozen Nobel laureates. Wow. Uh, one of them was Francis Crick, nice guy, by the way. Uh, and Jonas Salk was still there. So it was a, it was kind of a, a, uh, a high powered think tank on the cliffs in La Jolla. 
Uh, and of course, Jonas was a vaccinologist. Uh, <laughs> it was March of Dimes money that built the place. Uh, so um, really a temple uh, to science and vaccinology. And Tony Hunter uh, had was there and just has a steel trap of a mind for new ideas and new technology and new findings. Hmm. At the time, we really didn't have the internet. I mean, you couldn't go on PubMed and search the right. literature, but uh, Tony was basically PubMed in his brain. <laughs> uh, and and uh, he knew all kinds of stuff that was coming up. And so he told me that I should get in touch with this uh, young uh, faculty member at UCSF named Judy White. And uh, so I went to Judy White's lab and they had some, uh, they weren't working with luciferase at the time, they were working with clonfentacolostyl transferase, but they had a greatly improved RNA cassette that had structural elements um, that you would put before your open reading frame, that would be luciferase, and after your open reading frame. And they were working with these RNAs with reticulocyte lysates. So these are a uh, type of blood cell that you can extract to get proteins that would make other proteins from RNA. Uh, I don't think they were working with Xenophus, uh, but they were asking some of these fundamental questions. And uh, from them, I learned and obtained a plasmid. This is a circular piece of DNA that had these key RNA sequences that were necessary to get efficient translation, you know, production from RNA into protein of, uh, of transcribed, in vitro transcribed, that means, you know, synthesized in the test tube RNAs. So I brought that back, uh, swapped out the luciferase for the chloramphenicol estiol transferase, and then built, nobody had really done large scale preparations of RNA at that time. It, they would make very small quantities, and the enzymes were really expensive. Uh, and, uh, but I needed to have large quantities of RNA in order to ensure that I could do reproducible experiments with different variables sure. using the same uh, initial preparation. So I scaled this up to yield milligrams of RNA, which had not really been done before. And so I built the, the core... Uh, expression plasmid off of what I'd obtained from Judy White's lab, uh, developed the system for uh, producing the RNA at high concentration and high purity in, with, in, in a stable fashion, and uh, then started working with this. I never did get the, uh, the transfer of the, I spent just months on building the retroviral mRNA construct. And um, I, I was able to get a little bit of signal of, of virus particles coming out that could be detected in a plaque assay, but it, it really just didn't happen. Hmm. And uh, Inder was very disappointed in me. Uh, and and uh, he did things like, once he brought me a stack of other people's grant applications and said, read these and get ideas, Robert, um, <laughs> which ethically is just, you know, a little mind bending. Uh, but uh, that's, you know, that was the ethics there. Right. Uh, again, being, you know, big lab, uh, a lot of the rules get bent. So um, he was disappointed with me. And, uh, but this core method that I developed, Tony came to me one day and, and he had another one of these ahas, I know some information for you, Robert, you know, yeah. young Robert, <laughs> yeah. listen to this. Uh, I've got something for you that will solve your pain. Um, and it was a, a paper, the paper hadn't even come out yet. And he told me to talk to a guy named Gordon Ringgold at a company called Syntex in the Bay Area that had this new discovery that you could take positively charged lipids. We can talk science here. Um, so they're actually quaternary amine uh, um, based uh, lipids and uh, mix them with negative polynucleotides. So uh, RNA and DNA are, are basically a linear uh, polyanionic molecule. And these would spontaneously assemble. This had been, I'd worked with all kinds of different liposome preparations, 
trying to deliver the RNA. And the, the entrapment of polynucleotides inside a liposome is extremely inefficient and, mm-hmm. and time consuming and expensive. And you know, you'll, you're lucky to get an entrapment efficiency of 10 or 15%, which means you're throwing away 95, 80 to 95% of your polynucleotide, which is an expensive commodity. But this new tech caused spontaneous assembly of these positively charged lipids and the negatively charged polynucleotide. And uh, they had, they were mixed with other lipids that were fusogenic. They would cause fusion with cell membranes. And if you formulated these in the right ratio, they would stick efficiently to the surface of cells, cultured cells, and pull the polynucleotide in, and you would get, uh, in the case of what Syntex had been able to do, DNA transfection. So you could get naked, you could get DNA um, without a virus. Remember, I'm in a gene therapy lab focused on viruses for getting polynucleotides in, and get that DNA into the cell, eventually into the nucleus, and make protein. So um, Tony suggested I I contact Gordon. Gordon put me in touch with a guy named Phil Felgner, who eventually became my boss at Vical and was a collaborator then for a few months hmm. once this had happened. And uh, I exchanged a, a series of uh, emails and also filed a patent disclosure for the Salk before I, I contacted Phil, uh, having to do with using RNA as a drug. And uh, and Phil sent me this new reagent, and suddenly everything worked like crazy, uh, and and it was like you couldn't fail. The the mm. the the reagent was um, really working well, and what was a little ironic is that the Syntex crew had tried to make RNA delivery work, and they'd failed, which is why they were so glad to work with me because they hadn't done all this other stuff that I'd done before to build the, the platform. Right. Uh, so, so it was one of these moments in time where things came together and uh, suddenly I was able to efficiently deliver RNA into every single cell type I tested. And I went around the Salk Institute, gathered all of the different cell lines that everybody had, uh, including caterpillar cells because of people were starting to work with baculovirus that's, an, that's the uh, platform that the um, uh, Novavax product uses. So okay. this was you know, back in the 80s when all this technology was just kind of starting to happen. And I gathered all these, tested them, and then I did a series of experiments to show that you know, with statistics this time and linear projections and R-squared values and all that kind of stuff yeah. to show that you got a linear dose response with the RNA and compare these different structural elements in the RNA to show that the cap was important and the five prime and translator region was important, the three prime translation and the polyadenylation was important, et cetera, et cetera. So that led to this PNAS paper uh, that, that is really the foundational paper. And everybody still uses that basic construct and the same enzymes and basic technology that I scaled up to milligram levels, only now they do gram and kilogram synthesis of RNA uh, based on those same enzymes. Hmm. Uh, so that's, that's that part of the platform. In parallel, I had a postdoc that was kind of shepherding me, named Dan St. Louis, mentoring me. And Dan was working on retroviral a retroviral gene therapy project in which he would use the retrovirus to infect cells in culture, mouse cells, and then create a little artificial implant of those cells and place them into a mouse and observe the expression of the foreign transgene, a potentially therapeutic protein, in the mouse. Hmm. And uh, this method worked quite well for about three weeks and then it just shut down and there was no more protein expression. Hmm. And everybody was scratching their heads because I mentioned that this was a gene expression laboratory and so they were thinking about elegant ways for gene silencing in uh, retroviruses in, integrated into chromosomes. And I poured over the 
textbooks from my first two years of medical school. And I, and I came up with the hypothesis that, no, it wasn't any of that fancy stuff. It was that the mice were generating an immune response against the foreign transgene. And this was heresy. This, this, because what it meant was the whole logic of gene therapy was a failure. Right. Because uh, the fundamentals of immune response, and this was not an immunology lab, right? So that, that, that's, uh, um, and it meant that the, the, the truth is that if I have cystic fibrosis or muscular dystrophy or whatever, so I have a bad inherited error of metabolism in my genetics and my chromosomes. And I'm producing a deficient, a defective protein. It's defective in the terms of it's associated with my disease. Uh, my immune system doesn't know that it's a defective protein. It, it knows itself. It knows that bad protein is actually the normal protein for my body. That's the right. way the immune system works. And uh, so when one, if one introduces a, the good gene that doesn't have those genetic defects, the thinking was, oh, we're gonna, this is how we're gonna cure pediatric disease in born areas of metabolism. That was Ted's, because Ted is a pediatrician. Uh, but instead, what you run into is that the body will reject the good gene because all it knows is not that it's good, but that it's different. Right. And so suddenly, uh, here I am in this pressure cooker gene therapy lab, you know, having decided I was going to commit my entire life to uh, retroviral gene therapy, and uh, suddenly it's clear that ain't going to work. Right. And we, you know, Houston, we got a problem. And uh, so the brainstorm was, oh, okay, so let's make lemonade out of lemons. We can use the gene therapy technologies for vaccine purposes. We can turn the whole thing on its head and, and make what's a suddenly a disqualifying disadvantage for gene therapy into a major advantage for a whole new technology space, a whole new way to approach vaccinology. Hmm. That, so now I'm gonna circle back. I mentioned Dinko Valerio, this, the top status PhD in the whole laboratory that went on to create Crusoe. After we both left the lab, I saw him at a uh, gene therapy conference about three years later. And he, and he took me aside and he said, Robert, he had already started Crusoe at the time, which was focused on gene therapy. And uh, he said, Robert, you're right. Uh, I'm going to pivot Crucell from being a gene therapy company to being a vaccine company. And that's what set, then Crucell exploded, uh, yeah. was sold for, uh, I think, a billion and a half or something, and uh, to J&J. &J. And that is the lineage that gives the J&J &J vaccine. Hmm. So they both, the mRNA vaccines and the uh, adenoviral vectored vaccines trace back to Ender's lab in the late eighties with this Dan St. Louis and Dan didn't even make up much of it. Uh, he didn't really talk about it much in the paper and I am included in the acknowledgements as, you know, Bob Malone. Uh, we thank Bob Malone for, for his contributions or something like that. Uh, so, but meanwhile, back at the ranch, I was, I had, as a graduate student, you have to make your nickel somehow. I had a National Science Foundation fellowship, but the uh, one had to do uh, teaching uh, assistant rotations. And I was assigned to work uh, as a teaching assistant on an embryology lab. So one of the tasks that I had to do was to prepare frog embryos at different hmm. stages of development from African clawed frogs. This is one of the, the core uh, technologies used in modern embryology and developmental biology is the model system of Xenophis Lavis. So I was preparing these eggs and fertilizing the eggs and making the tadpoles and whatever. And at one of the preparations, I had tadpoles at a certain stage of development all timed. And I had way more than I needed for the class. And so I thought, ah, you know, everything else works with this. Let's try frogs. And <coughs> lo and behold, it did work. So I took, took the same RNA, the same RNA reagents, 
and then also did this with a DNA that gives a colored uh, reaction, beta galactosidase. Put them on the frog embryos, and lo and behold, uh, we got luciferase, and then we got beta galactosidase. The beta gal was localized to the eyes, and that led to other things that other people did subsequently in embryology. But uh, then the next step in the embryology course was we had to prepare something called chicken a cup, which is a way to prepare chick embryos so that you can observe their development. Hmm. And so again, I had extra chicks that I prepared from fertilized eggs. And uh, in that case, take, took the same method uh, reagents with DNA, put them on the chick embryos, and lo and behold, that worked. Hmm. So now I'm sitting on dynamite in terms of intellectual property. Right. And I filed a patent disclosure with the Salk Institute um, that they determined I was the sole inventor for having to do with the use of RNA as a drug and RNA delivery into uh, cells in animals. And uh, that's when the problem started. And uh, it, it, it became such a storm, um, uh, dropping the first part of that word, uh, that um, I, I got caught in the middle of a huge fight over uh, who would own this, UC San Diego, the investigator who'd been, who'd been the, the uh, professor for the embryology course, uh, want, thought she should be an inventor. Inder thought that he should be an inventor uh, because he was my mentor, not because he contributed. Right. Um, uh, the president of the Salk Institute, uh, uh, de Hoffman, called Inder on the carpet for setting up this illicit collaboration with Syntex because at the time they were trying to route all the intellectual property into their for-profit subsidiary of the Salk called Salk Institute Biologic Associates. And so Inder got called on the carpet. I got called in and asked, what the heck have you done, young man? And uh, and I told the story and Inder flat out denied knowing anything about what I'd done with the Salk Institute. Uh, with, I'm sorry, with Syntex. Uh, Tony later told me, well, what did you expect? Of course he lied. Um, and, and I, and it, it, the cognitive dissonance got to the point where I had a nervous breakdown. Really? It's not bad. And I was diagnosed as having PTSD by a UC San Diego physician. And, uh, you know, the crossfire of the, the attorneys at UC San Diego telling me I couldn't talk to the people at the Salk, people at the Salk saying I couldn't talk to UCSD. I was just a pawn. I mean, literally, uh, Mongo is a pawn in the game of life. I was Mongo at that point, if you understand, if you remember Blazing Saddles is the reference. And I, it was overwhelming. Wow. And I had to leave the laboratory. The laboratory was an abusive environment anyhow. And you can, it, your, your listeners can look up Ender Verma and Science Magazine and find out things about Ender that we don't want to go into right now. Uh, but, um, so it was a very abusive work environment, but I, it was, it, I just came and glued. And uh, I still kind of have the scars a little bit from that. Sorry uh, about but that. That's the way things are. Uh, you know, it happens, to a lot it, of right graduate students. it happens to a lot of graduate students. Uh, that's part of what gives me the comfort in telling this story and being open about it, is I've had many former graduate students, including from the Salk, uh, and scripts and that were in this pressure cooker environment where everybody thought they were going to get rich. I mean, that's what's really driving us. We've talked about that. It's always all about the Benjamins. That's right. And people smelled money and, and they wanted it. Right. Yep. And, and it ended up, I, the only, I didn't get any compensation for any of this except, uh, reading forward, uh, one Susan B. Anthony dollar from Vical for, for, uh, the rights to all my patents, the stuff that I contributed. Hmm. So I needed to get out of the lab. My wife needed to finish her bachelor's. And uh, um, so I needed a job for the next six months or so while she finished her bachelor's degree at UC San Diego. And 
the guy that I had been collaborating with, Phil Feldner, and that I'd put on the RNA PNAS paper over Ender's Objections, had been recruited as the first employee of a company that had been set up by Carl Hostetler and Doug Richmond called Vical. And Vical was set up in the old cyclotron that was right across Torrey Pines Road in the other direction from UC San Diego, it, which was uh, you know small uh, lease space for biotech startups and engineering startups. So the old cyclotron, it's a pretty grubby space. Uh, and uh, Carl had created this company together with Doug Richmond to look at uh, antiviral compounds for Burroughs Welcome that were liposomally captured. So this was uh, the early days of AIDS uh, antiviral development and Doug Richman was right at the forefront. Hmm. And so he had a contract to take uh, anti-HIV antivirals and put them in liposomes so they'd go into macrophage, which was the reservoir for the AIDS virus. And, uh, and Carl wanted to make calcitonin analogs, Carl Hostetler. Carl went on to create Triangle Pharmaceuticals with Ray Shinazi, and that's you know that's the hepatitis B antivirals and mm. and you know great things happened. Um, sure. Carl's had an illustrious history, but that was the genesis of Vical. It was founded, I think, in '88. Uh, um, uh, Phil joined in uh, late '89, and he said, "Robert, since you got to leave Ender's lab, why don't you come work for me?" And we will give you the money to set you up with a little skunk works in the corner and set up your molecular biology. And so I brought over my reagents, uh, my plasmids, actually some RNA I had made, a bunch of this lipofectin reagent that Phil had shipped me from Syntex. So I actually brought the lipids. I was a, 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 I was a mule, I guess, uh, for, <laughs> for uh, transferring these drugs uh, from Syntex into uh, Vical uh, by way of the sulk. You know, I was naive and just trying to, to get my science keep moving. Sure. And they set up a collaboration with a guy named John Wolf who had just left. He had gotten burned out on retroviral vectors. I'd known him when he was at Ted Friedman's lab. And he'd been burned out on retroviral vector gene transfer and got a position as a pediatrician at uh, University of Wisconsin. And UW gave him some access to some animals, rats initially, in animal facilities. And uh, so John, in, uh, Phil convinced John to collaborate on this new technology that had, you know, come out of Syntex and out of Ender's lab. And uh, so John was going to be the uh, animal injection characterization group. I was the uh, you know, manufacturing the polynucleotides and kind of the core technology. And then we had a couple chemists at Vical that were working on the other projects, the liposomal uh, uh, nucleotides. Uh, and they started synthesizing novel cationic lipids that would be outside of the patent of Syntex. And uh, all this came together with me shipping John uh, samples, including blinded samples, of mixtures of initially DNA plus cationic lipids. And John didn't believe in luciferase yet. It, that's how new it was. Uh, mm. um, and that it would be useful in vivo. Uh, eventually, I converted him. Uh, and the initial cat assays uh, were positive. Um, and I think the initial studies in rats were done with DNA, but then we tested the RNA in uh, mice. And, and I have the first data is posted on the website of, of those. Those have never been published, those first experiments. But I have the initial chloramphenicol acetyl transferase films uh, from the first mRNA experiments. And uh, this is another part of this amazing story. We initially, the lipid RNA complexes uh, worked in the mouse to everyone's you know, amazement and joy. Uh, it was like, hallelujah, uh, here we are. Uh, and one of the chemists named Raj Kumar was a great skeptic and uh, said, uh, 
you guys aren't doing good science. Now, I had done the negative controls, I don't know how many times with the frogs and the chicks, and it never worked. Hmm. The negative controls being not including the cationic lipid with the polynucleotide. But Raj insisted that we had to do this with the mice also. And that we, and basically to shut Raj up, I'm, to be honest, uh, you know, just to make him go away and stop yapping about negative controls that weren't, you know, were irrelevant. Um, uh, I shipped John the samples with and without the cationic lipids and cationic lipids alone. So I did the full spectrum of positive and negative controls. We already knew that the cationic lipids plus the RNA would work. So that was the positive control. And his uh, postdoc injected them, worked up the cat assays, and we got a fax back that showed that, yes, once again, the cationic lipid plus RNA had worked. And, and uh, I said, you know, we get on the phone. This is old school old technology. Time, right? Old school technology, you know, came across by fax. <laughs> and I got on the phone and I called up John, you know, landline, of course. And uh, no, hardly any, you know, right. we had like intranet. Right. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, uh, and we thought that was pretty cool. Uh, yeah. and, and I called up John and I said, yeah, but John, this lane over here is positive And this was supposed to be the negative control. And he says, ah, the technician must have screwed up. And, and some of the assay from the adjacent lane must have been in that one. And I said, okay, we got to do it again. Um, right. and so I sent John more samples and, uh, lo and behold, the RNA alone was as good or better than the RNA plus the lipid. Hmm. And then we did it with DNA and that led to the science paper that's so famous uh, that came out in 1990 that uh, um, came out just a couple of months after the cold fusion paper came out. And the world reacted that this was another science screw up uh, and cold fusion uh, applied to molecular biology. But in this case, everybody all across the world could reproduce it. And, uh, and so the patents were written about how this, and I, and I spent hours and hours in downtown San Diego with a top-notch patent attorney talking about how this could be used in all the various applications. And I actually disclosed uh, the use of targeted mutagenesis to produce what we would now call gain of function mutations in influenza that could be used for vaccine purposes to build a universal influenza vaccine. I don't think that Vikel ever completely comprehended that patent disclosure, hmm. but uh, it was way, way ahead of its time, you know, like by two decades, three decades, right. as was most of this stuff. Um, so the, the, you know, I, I, because of my time with Bob Lamb and my Tom with Murray and Preston Marks and all that, I had a pretty good handle on influenza vaccinology and HIV vaccinology and, mm -hmm. uh, the use of anti-sense. And I was, uh, communicating with Tom Sheck about, uh, his, this is before he got the Nobel for ribosomes about the use of ribosomes to stabilize the RNA and, and just my mind, you know, was on hyperdrive then. I was sure. right at the forefront of all this. And, uh, and my supervisor uh, really felt uncomfortable, I think. Uh, you know, um, I think a good supervisor, it's good to try to hire people that are your match or perhaps even better intellectually. Um, you know, and manage those people. This guy uh, was uncomfortable with that. It made him very uncomfortable. And he started really aggressively trying to claim credit for what I had done and what I was doing and signing off on invention disclosures. And it was just clear that I couldn't stay as a technician, you know, with a master's degree. I had to go finish my MD. Jill finished her, her bachelor's and I resigned from Vical. And it was, I was only there for about four or five months. And okay. all of this technology came out of there. And it was all orthogonal to the Vical business plan. And so they, they hired some people. Uh, Stan Gromkowski is one. Gary Rhodes is another. Suzanne Parker is another. 
with uh, assistance of Doug Richmond, they set up the influenza model to in mice to try to verify the things that I had invented, disclosed, conceived of, et cetera, using sure. an influenza model. And it worked. And, uh, um, and they were, with Stan's help, they were able to demonstrate not only did it generate antibodies, uh, but it also generated cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which was what the theory was that this, this would more replicate a natural viral infection. So you get a more complete immune response than with the standard vaccine. Hmm. And, uh, um, and so the patents ended up issuing. Vical sold all these patents to Merck for a little over 9 million, which at the time was a lot of money for them. Absolutely. They, were, they were gasping for air at this point and for, for capital. And so this 9 million would fuel their other programs. And this, the whole thing was just not in the you know, business model of Vical from the outset. Right. Merck had, this was uh, Merck under Maurice Hilleman, Merck vaccines before Maurice Hilleman died. So the, you know, the brilliant vaccinologist that created many of our pediatric vaccines in the mid century era. Hmm. So Maurice was still there. And Merck insisted that they be able to take credit uh, publicly for the inventions and the work. And uh, so uh, Merck basically took what Doug Richman and the team had done with the mouse model, repackaged it, um, put their own people on the paper in senior positions, and got it published in science. And that just set the world on fire. Hmm. And everybody was off on a race to build DNA vaccines, which is they had, there had been a decision when I left, I think nobody could really make the RNA. And so Vical decided, well, we're going to go with the easy thing, which is the DNA. And uh, that was the fork in the road. Uh, Merck also looked at the RNA and decided that just didn't make sense chemically. Uh, because RNA stability and the manufacturing cost, et cetera. And they were going to only focus on the DNA. They spent many years, never developed a product, spent gobs of money uh, and gave up, returned the technology to Vical. Uh, Vical then spent tons of investor money, well over a billion dollars, never could make a product and eventually went bankrupt wow. when the patents uh, uh, expired. But what they did in the interim was they were very aggressive legally, both Merck and Vical, and they kept everybody else from doing anything with these ideas and the technology, including me, sending me as a then young academic uh, cease and desist letters saying you will not work on these things that uh, you did when you were with us previously. Wow. So there, that's that's a, you know that's a story of uh, uh, how science really is. Uh, not uh, how it gets into the textbooks as all happy, happy, and we're all seeking wisdom and enlightenment. Uh, that's that's modern modern biotechnology is uh, really dr driven by profit, and it distorts a lot of things. Uh, so you asked, uh, and that's the most complete discussion I've ever given on on how this all came about. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to to thank you. Um, share it. If you don't mind, Robert, I'd like to get into the meat of now the current vaccination for COVID, if that's okay. Yep. Yeah. I think the first question that I have is in terms of the FDA approval timeline, and I understand, and I think it's important that we make it clear that you are not involved at a government level currently, or even with any of the big pharma companies, correct? So I don't, well, uh, not involved with the government is, is a little more nuanced. Um, I, I, let's take that one first. Please. Well, uh, no, the, the pharma, the pharma is uh, dead easy. I have no financial hit or historic or present consulting relationship with Pfizer, BioNTech, uh, Moderna, or CureVac. Okay. So those are the lead companies. I do uh, have a longstanding professional relationship with the gentleman, uh, the uh, senior emeritus professor uh, at uh, University of British Columbia, 
um, Peter Cullis, who uh, is the one that in my mind has made the most important enabling subsequent discovery, which is the development of an improved catanic lipid different from the quaternary amine. It's, it's uh, an ionizable amine uh, that has enabled the uh, amazing in vivo, so in, in humans and in animals, delivery efficiency that we see and is the basis, they, they actually license his formulation technology and his composition of matter uh, for both CureVac and BioNTech Pfizer products. In a case, of, I, I assert that the Moderna product technology is reverse engineered of what Peter and his group have developed over the last 40 years. So, um, uh, so there's that, but I have, I have a, that's just a professional relationship like I would have with and, and any other academic. Sure. And I have no financial conflicts of interest relating to these vaccines on the government side. Uh, I, I've had, uh, very active interactions with us, some senior members of the FDA that reside outside of the review branch. So FDA is parsed into different segments and you generally can't interact with the review branch people that are actively reviewing INDs or other regulatory documents associated with licensure or authorization to proceed <coughs> with any of these vaccines. Um, so there's that. With uh, One should know that I got a call from Wuhan, from uh, a person that's part of our intelligence community who was in Wuhan during the fourth quarter of 2019. He called me in the first week in January, I think January 3rd, thereabouts, and said, Robert, you got to get your team spun up uh, for uh, this new virus. This is a big one, and it's looking um, like it's going to be important and a major threat agent. Hmm. At the time, I was a senior member of a team working for Department of Defense on a contract for uh, screening and developing agents, drug agents, as countermeasures for organophosphates, which is to say chemical warfare agents and also pesticides. Hmm. So, so I had a team that, were, that included people in, in high throughput screening, in uh, structure-based drug design, and in uh, computational uh, analysis, high throughput analysis of uh, existing compounds as potential inhibitor agents, uh, Josh Patel. And uh, so I convinced this team, uh, well, the, the sequence was published either January 10th or January 11th as the Wuhan seafood market virus. And I got that sequence, uh, immediately used some computational tools to convert one of the key uh, protein sequences, the papain-like protease, into using the known structure of, of the papain-like protease from SARS and, and converted that to a predicted crystal structure for uh, SARS-CoV-2, for that protein. And then uh, we started docking, uh, which is this computational process of fitting molecules into a known binding pocket. Uh, um, uh, started docking all currently licensed compounds as a drug repurposing effort. I had done a threat assessment at that time, and it was my assessment that there was no way that we would have, with the standard licensing process for vaccines, no way that we would be able to have a vaccine in a timely fashion to mitigate the risk of this disease. And the best way, knowing what I know about regulatory affairs, to come up with something that would help people was to uh, repurpose existing drugs. I had uh, previously created a company called Etheric, uh, working closely with the Department of Defense and USAMRID to screen repurposed drugs for Zika. So I knew this space. That company had gone bankrupt because there was no capital interest in repurposing drugs because you can't make a lot of money on them because they're already off patent. Uh, so, uh, so I knew the space and that's what I focused on was drug repurposing and have since. So this whole issue of 
of the vaccine toxicology is something that has come to me. Uh, I've, I've been aware of it and cautioning my colleagues at FDA about certain aspects because I know the core technology and, and know what it can do and what it is doing. And there were things that they really weren't thinking about um, that I tried to help them think about. So that's how I got involved in this vaccine toxicity story. Okay. And uh, then there was a series of other events that involving physicians discussions and that, that I'm also rigorously trained in bioethics as is my wife. Uh, and uh, actually previously had been a whistleblower in the Jesse Gelsinger death case with the adenoviral vectors. Hmm. Uh, so I've, I've been through the scrum but usually with the press, I don't seek attention. Uh, I, I stay on background. But the, the issues here were such, particularly the bioethics, that I kind of came out, my customer, primary customer, DOD people, they don't really like me to be talking in public very much. Sure. Uh, and uh, they're tolerating this, uh, but they're biting, you know, they're gritting their teeth a little bit. Um, but, uh, so that's, that's, I don't have the COI. I do work closely with the government. Um, I've been working on, uh, over the span on uh, four different, five different government contracts. Um, I've captured over $130 million in government contracts specifically for uh, a drug, among other things, drug repurposing and platform trials uh, with a company called Quantum Leap Healthcare out of UCSF. And we currently, through my, I'm a subcontractor to Lidos, uh, um, a very large uh, government service provider, and we're moving forward with uh, an IND, uh, so getting ready for the large double-blind randomized clinical trials for uh, the combination that I've uh, developed together with some investigators at a Beloit Memorial in Wisconsin uh, that is the, the drug combination celecoxib and famotidine. Uh, this has solid uh, um, a mechanism based uh, mechanism of action based logic as opposed to ivermectin and some of the others and really strongly positive results. Uh, so those trials are about to start. So that's my COI here if I have one is that I've been deeply embedded in drug repurposing uh, but been brought into this uh, discussion about the vaccine toxicology, which I know quite a bit about also, um, and regulatory aspects and the bioethics. Um, as, a, as a kind of an outside observer with deep knowledge uh, in, and uh, the ability to explain uh, core concepts and issues to folks that aren't necessarily, uh, you know, deep in the gears of uh, dealing with this stuff. Does that help? Yes. Have I answered your question? <clears throat> you have. And in terms of the drug repurposing, it, I want to make it clear for listeners. What are you exactly saying? You're, if you can explain drug repurposing for this case, if you can explain that so people are very clear on what you're talking about. Oh, sure. And, and there's a video clip from back uh, in my etheric days. I think it's 1980, no, 19, uh, 2017, two, uh, the time passes, 2017. And you can find it on Contagion Live on their uh, podcasts, uh, me talking about drug repurposing, if you want to get deeper into it. Okay. The core logic is that um, we have a large uh, pharmacopoeia is the technical term, of drugs uh, that have been licensed over time for various purposes. And uh, so the way it works with the FDA is that uh, one obtains approval to market. That's what licensing really is. And interstate commerce, technically, that's why the FDA has the authority to do this, is it's interstate commerce, uh, to, to market um, and provide uh, agents which have therapeutic or prophylactic benefit 
that have met all the safety criteria and are manufactured in a way that is consistent and not adulterated and potent, et cetera. And so one obtains these authorizations uh, for a specific purpose, but physicians are allowed by their licenses to use any of the agents in the pharmacopoeia in general within certain limits uh, to treat their patients. So you can take a chemotherapeutic drug and you may use it to treat a uh, autoimmune disease or, uh, or a um, chronic inflammatory disease. Okay. And it may not be labeled for that purpose, but right. as a physician, you're allowed to prescribe it for that purpose. So those are the rules. And uh, as a physician, you have to operate within certain boundaries. You can't just do crazy stuff because otherwise you'll get sued. Uh, and uh, so you have to kind of stay within the bounds of standard of care. That's, that's the drug landscape in general. There are, because we now have so many decades of experience, and as I mentioned before, patents are only good for 20 years right. in general. Uh, drugs that have been marketed for a particular purpose, a great example is ivermectin, uh, the investigator at, no, at Merck that, in, that developed ivermectin <coughs> received the Nobel Prize for his discovery of over 40 years ago. So ivermectin is off patent as one example. Hydroxychloroquine is another one that's off patent. So that once what that means is that generic drug manufacturers can come in and produce those drugs and make them available to the public at greatly reduced rates. And we all know about that. We go to Walmart and the pharmacist says, yeah, I'm going to give you the generic, right? right. And why are they going to give you the generic? Because your insurance will only pay for the generic. They don't want to pay full price for the patented one. Right. So that's how that part of the drug industry works. But these agents have been uh, have many activities, and they may have activities that have not yet been discovered, which is why one uses these kinds of tools, like I was des describing, of computational docking and high throughput screening and high content imaging. And there's a whole bunch of cool new stuff that is very AI, cloud, et cetera, driven. Right. That involves big data that allows us to set up assays with, uh, um, you've seen them in all the movies, the little plates with all the little wells. Um, so yeah. these are high, high throughput assays that involve machine uh, screening, et cetera. Um, I was, wife and I were just watching The Tomorrow War, uh, which is just up, I think, on Netflix. And that, that kind of tech plays a big role in, in uh, the, the, um, uh, the storyline. Uh, so you can see examples of that kind of a modern approach in that you know, Hollywood piece. So high throughput screening, um, computational sequencing, artificial intelligence, deep learning, applications, a lot of cool stuff. And uh, what's done is you can apply I mean, we have libraries of compound structures now that are uh, billions of compounds. And, and you can uh, um, write a purchase order for uh, high density plates that are all plated with different drugs and different drug candidates and then run them through your assay and see whether or not they inhibit your, your virus replication, your protein, and what have you. That's, that's uh, the cutting edge right now is, is that world. And... Uh, um, so with repurposed drugs, you can take those libraries of things that are already licensed and already licensed off patent and nutraceuticals and all these exist as compound structure libraries and compound libraries that you can just write a purchase order and get them shipped to you um, and as high density plates. And uh, so the, the logic is that one screens all of these drugs to find the few hits, that's the language, <clears throat> that look promising for some new indication. And it may be related to the known mechanism of action, or it may be a new mechanism of action for the drug. And uh, many, of course, or I'm not the only one that does this and, and knows of this kind of approach. And sure. so many, many labs all over the world started doing this. 
And uh, we were one of them, maybe one of the early ones, but many followed. And, uh, and so that's the logic is that one identifies a compound that is ideally off patent, generic, which means inexpensive, typically widely available. The safety profile of that in humans is already known because it's had to go through the licensure process. The chemistry manufacturing controls dossier to produce that at safe and unadulterated, as a safe and unadulterated product is already known. Right. And so that cuts out about two to three years. You know, you have the, the toxicology is already known, the manufacturing is already known, it's already being produced at scale by various generic drug manufacturers. The safety in humans is already known. All you have left to do is prove efficacy or effectiveness for your new indication. Right. That shaves a ton of time off of the life cycle, which normally is a decade or more and a billion dollars or more. Wow. Okay, so, so that's the core logic of drug repurposing in the teeth of an outbreak is all, all of this stuff. The, the RNA vaccine technology, the DNA vaccines, and all the stuff I've done for you know decades is all wrapped around how can we rapidly respond to either an engineered or emerging pathogen. I transferred, I stopped being an academic and started working for the government right after 9-11 mm. and worked for the DOD under contract uh, on virtually all of the vaccines and biodefense products at that time, smallpox, anthrax, uh, V, et cetera, it goes on and on, mm. tularemia. Uh, so, so that's, that's the way things are in that kind of world that I live in now with uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, Joint Science Technology Office. Uh, the domain program kind of partially comes out of my head, which is uh, wrapped around how do we use these kinds of ideas like drug repurposing to rapidly respond to an outbreak. So that's, there's the logic of drug repurposing. It's, it's a potential pathway to uh, a rapidly providing uh, pharmaceutical agents as opposed to prophylactic vaccine agents that uh, would be um, able to uh, fill in the gap uh, between when a novel uh, biologic threat enters the population, either because of deforestation or whatever other thing, sure. you know, bats or whatever, uh, you know, the Ebola being an example, um, or, or the bad guys have done garage biology and engineered the darn thing, right. um, which is increasing, increasingly the, the big risk. And let me just close on one last fun little fact about this, since you Please have a wonk, wonky audience. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, one of the key truths here is that uh, the Department of Defense is on track to have vaccines for all of the biowarfare agents deployed through the end of World War II, historically. It's tularemia and, and plague and smallpox on it. Uh, we'll have vaccines for all those by, if, if everything stays on schedule, which is a problem, by 2050, okay? So a full century after all of those were deployed, okay? So clearly wow. that is not working. We gotta come up with something better. And that, that is what drives uh, current uh, thinking in the Department of Defense and the people that I work with who are supporting the war fighter, not the civilian population. Right. And uh, that and how do we respond to uh, um, engineered threats, particularly in terms of uh, protecting um, uh, the uh, uh, special forces uh, that are small strike teams that go into threat arenas, and and so that's that's the that's the world that I currently work in, uh, and have since two thousand one for the most part. Robert, and, and I want to make it clear that you're not saying that drug repurposing would replace a vaccine. It is literally. It is literally to mitigate the risk currently. That's what it would be for, to take masses and mitigate risk down with 
millions of people infected with whether it's COVID or another virus, correct? Correct. And, and it has, uh, so they're not competitive. <laughs> right. They're complementary, right? Right. right. Uh, and, and the logic was back then that uh, if we had the ability to obtain drugs that were active in reducing and knowing that they would not be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And knowing, remember, I come from the AIDS world. So the thing that, that beat AIDS was not a vaccine, as we know, unfortunately, um, right. but rather uh, the David Ho largely gets the credit for the brainstorm of using multiple drugs that constrain the ability of the AIDS virus to evolve in your body. Right. And, and this has to do with, it's a big numbers game. If, if you have a, a one in 10 to the sixth probability of uh, developing an escape mutant against uh, um, one drug during your infection, and uh, a one in 10 to the sixth probability of escape mutant from another drug, and likewise for a third drug, um, as you know, as a technical person, uh, your, your probability of escaping all three is a product. Right. Uh, and so we get down to the teeny tiny numbers, uh, which is what you have to do with viruses because they have huge numbers of progeny. Uh, and those progeny have mutations and that's what drives viral evolution. It's a, it's a very special extreme case of, of evolution, virus, viral evolution is. Um, and we're dealing with that right now with the escape mutants, by the way. Uh, but um, so the logic is with the drug repurposing in antivirals is to come up with multi drugs that each are imperfect, but act together in a way that um, is complementary and idealistic, you know, in, in the best of all possible worlds, they're synergistic, uh, but that's often difficult to get to. But even if they're additive in terms of their activity, uh, you can you can really get something much more powerful out of things that are imperfect. While while the great brains of Pfizer and Gilead and Merck and everybody else are busy developing new stuff uh, and and working along that ten year trajectory, God bless them. You, we kind of need something to uh, take care of folks now. Now, uh, and so that's the logic. Uh, here and it's absolutely not. It's complementary, uh, even even with as no no uh, with Delta variant. Right. These these miraculous vaccines that we have and what's happened with the technology, both the adenoviral vector technology and the mRNA, both genetic vaccines, um, based on gene therapy, the the results have exceeded expectations. Gently put, uh, but. Uh, they're not perfect either. They're not blocking viral infection, replication, or transmission. Um, and so uh, um, it, we still need agents, even in a perfect world where everybody takes vaccine. Right. We're still going to have viral infection. We're still going to have disease. And anybody that doesn't believe that, all they have to do is look at the Israeli data or the British data right now with the Delta variant uh, in highly vaccinated populations. So absolutely not competitive, complementary. Okay. Do you believe in the vaccines currently offered? Belief, I try, as a scientist, I really try to stay away from belief. Uh, I try to stay on data. And um, they, what we have is a situation where like with every vaccine, there is no perfectly safe drug. Um, people like to say even water taken at sufficient doses is toxic. Uh, and um, just to make the point as you take a drink. Uh, yep. and, um, uh, and the same is true with vaccines. There's no perfectly safe vaccine. The question is always with any product, what is the um, relative risk associated with the product when you take it and what is the nature of those risks and what is the relative risk of the thing that you're trying to mitigate or treat and in in the case of of this disease covid which is different covid disease 
is the inflam hyperinflammatory reaction of your body against the virus. Okay? It's different from the, there's a viral syndrome that happens soon after you get infected that is truly more like an influenza. Hmm. But there are characteristics of this virus that provoke the immune system of some people to just go nutso. And uh, that is, is a subset of people that get infected that develop that. And um, that, it turns out, is inflammatory in nature. And the good news, the reason to underscore that point, is that it's wicked hard to develop effective antivirals, things that directly block the virus. And with respiratory viruses, historically, like flu, Tamiflu, we all know Tamiflu, right? Donald sure. Rumsfeld made lots of money in this company called Gilead. Uh, it's really hard, especially with retro respiratory viruses, to come up with an agent that will really impact the disease course. Uh, and to the extent that they do impact the disease course, even if they're very effective in cell culture, they have to be administered very early on at a time in this virus when most people don't even know they're infected. Mm -hmm. So that's the history of, and in the case of flu with remdesivir, I mean with um, the Tamiflu, um, you have to take it kind of within the first 24 to 48 hours of being infected, which is really problematic, you know? Hmm, right. I've got a runny nose. I feel kind of crummy. I'm going to go to the doctor and he's going to give me a drug for flu. Yeah, good luck scheduling right. your flu appointment uh, unless you go to a doc in the box. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just that it doesn't, it's not practical. And that the same is true with COVID. But the good news is that we do have a rich library of drug agents for treating inflammatory diseases because they're a profitable, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so we've got all these things and a bunch of them are off patent and it looks like a number of them have activity and they're not perfect, like I said. So, so the, there we go, proper coughing technique demonstrated. Uh, so so that's, that's that space. I hope I've answered whatever that question was that I was reacting to. Do you think that there's a certain vaccine, Moderna, Pfizer, that a specific person should take. And I know it's hard because it's, you can't categorize every person okay. and everybody. Oh, good. So this, this follows the thread that I was just developing, but I got lost on. Uh, okay. So thanks for bringing me back on the reservation. Um, in general, uh, you won the, the, the proper, the right and proper way to proceed in this area. Um, once, uh, once you have enough data to make uh, evidence-based medical decisions, right. is that, uh, which we didn't have at first, you know, so uh, people had to substitute expert opinion. But now we can make data-based decisions. And what you do is, and have always done, what the CDC has always done, is to evaluate what we call the risk-benefit ratio. I was referring to that earlier the risk of disease from the pathogen in this case, which is distributed across the entire population versus the risk of uh, associated with the uh, intervention vaccine. And you stratify those risks into the various uh, key populations. And the way they're usually defined is uh, infants, children, two and above, uh, adolescents, uh, healthy normal adults greater than 18 and typically up to 65, yeah. elderly, 65 and above, pregnant women, and uh, special populations like immunocompromised or uh, people with allergies or other pre existing risk conditions. Okay. And you do the risk benefit ratio for each of those populations, and then you make a decision to recommend you should take vaccine if you're at this risk benefit ratio. But if you're not at that risk benefit ratio, you don't take vaccine because you might cause more harm than good. In this case, uh, we have a disease. You know, I went over that a moment ago. Sure. Um, the disease COVID-19 is 
primarily disease of the elderly. And your risk goes exponential the older you get. And the obese. And people with certain pre-existing conditions, which we don't completely understand yet. Vascular leak syndrome is one that's very clear. Uh, other types of inflammatory diseases, potentially cancer and other conditions, certain types of cancer or being immunosuppressed from chemotherapy, those kind of things. So, so the answer to your question is, hmm, it's complicated uh, because uh, I, you know, to, and there are algorithms, by the way, that, uh, that are AI ML based. Uh, so it's as a techie, you'll appreciate that. Yeah. That just do an awesome job of predicting your risk of developing severe disease or death. And the AIs have taken into account, it, some of the key variables are your zip code, uh, your, the size of your house and the density of people in your house, indirect measures having to do with socioeconomic status. And these are AIs built off of non-HIPAA controlled data. So they're not actually built off of healthcare data that's protected but all of the amazing data sets that, that every all big tech has on all of us, Amazon, et cetera, that you can buy these databases, run the AIs through, and, uh, and they come up with uh, quite uh, remarkably predictive scores. Interesting. Now, if, I, if, I, if, they, if I was king, uh, I would say, hmm, let's make those available to everybody so right. they can figure out their own risk and make their own decisions about vaccination. But in their infinite wisdom, the, the government has not decided to take that path at this point in time. Uh, so, uh, but it could be possible and you can inform yourself about your risks. It's not easy. Um, your risks of disease, a lot of that you would have to be somebody like me that's you know comfortable diving into the primary literature. Sure. Uh, or you could rely on your doctor who's probably going to say, just take the jab and shut up. Um, uh, and uh, so um, because they don't have any time because they're not budgeted for doing that. They're budgeted to give you a jab in the shoulder and tell you to move on. Uh, so and to really make your own personal assessment of risk benefit ratio, you have to understand what the risks are. And uh, again, in their wisdom, the government has decided on the noble lie strategy of denying that there are risks or only disclosing risks if they're absolutely forced to and uh, just insisting that everybody get the jab and putting out a whole huge army of deploying amazingly powerful tools to convince the population that they should take the jab. But the, the, those old gray hairs like me um, uh, that have been through this and through multiple outbreaks say, yeah, but uh, if you're, if you're, the data show that if you're an infant through about the age of 40, this is increasingly clear, even with the limited data we have in understanding of the risks of these genetic vaccines, the adenovirus vectors plus the RNAs, um, the risks for newborns through about age 40 are at the margins or upside down, uh, for taking vaccine versus your risk of getting COVID, severe COVID to the point where you're hospitalized or you die. Hmm. So, so many of us are saying, no, 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 this has got to stop. Um, uh, we can't, especially f these are still experimental products. And so this gets into the bioethics, the fundamental bioethics that go back to uh, the uh, Nuremberg trials and the Helsinki Accords and the Belmont report here in the States and it's codified in federal law as the common rule. I'll say that for an experimental product, you there must be full and complete disclosure of risks. Those risks have to be comprehended and comprehensible. So that in the States that translates to eighth grade language. Right. And uh, the person has to accept the experimental product of their own accord by free choice, free will. They cannot be coerced mm -hmm. and they cannot be um, uh, uh, compelled through uh, incentives like uh, lottery 
tickets or shotguns or whatever right. else, uh, or ice cream uh, for the adolescents. And in the case of adolescents, and you know, infants and children, uh, we define the age of consent as 18, and so by definition, they cannot provide informed consent, and their parents or their guardians have to. So that's those are the rules. And, and we have decided to, uh, the government has decided to disregard those rules, even though they're in federal law, uh, and um, put out all this information and censorship to try to keep people from even discussing things, even scientists discussing risks or other aspects of all this. So don't put this up on YouTube. You may get deleted. Uh, um, so in terms of the specific vaccines, in my opinion, I, I've been asked this question uh, countless times, as you might imagine. Sure. Uh, and it, I have deep knowledge of the adenoviral vectored technology. The, the thing about all of this is that the FDA did not apply the gene therapy regulatory checklist to these products. They only applied the vaccine checklist. And so they didn't require that the developers do genotoxicity or full reproductive toxicity. And they didn't require them to characterize how much of the protein insert in the gene therapy technology. In all cases, this is the viral spike protein um, with a uh, two amino acid modifications that were designed to make it more immunogenic, not designed to make it more safe. So uh, that's a misconception that Reuters has promoted. They were not required to characterize where this protein was being expressed, for how long, in what cell types, uh, and at what level. Hmm. So none of that is known. Is that frightening to you? Um, it's concerning, uh, frightening. I took Moderna uh, twice. I probably shouldn't have. I did have adverse events from that on top of my long COVID. Uh, I, I developed grade three hypertension, restless leg syndrome, and other symptoms that I hadn't had before. Interesting. Uh, so the hypertension is one of the adverse events that's associated in some people. And I'm not... Uh, I'm not a uh, the 135 pound uh, young buck that I once was anymore, uh, right. so I I have to blame myself for not being in perfect shape also. But just knocking off the adenoviral vectors in the states—that's the J and J product. Adenoviral vectors were designed for long expression of high levels of protein for gene therapy purposes, and so I infer in the absence of data because they weren't required to characterize this, that there will be uh, substantial amounts of uh, protein transgene, spike protein, produced from the adenoviral vectors for long periods of time with those vaccines. I have suggested generally that people avoid those vaccines for that reason. Okay. Now talking about the RNA ones, there's only two on the license, uh, li or, or they're not licensed, I apologize. These are all under emergency use authorization, so they remain experimental. Of the two mRNA vaccines, one has Pfizer and Moderna. Remember that Moderna is a company that was created by DARPA, uh, and uh, the vaccine itself was engineered by the Vaccine Research Center at NIH. So it's good to know that Tony, that uh, Dr. Fauci's uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease re receives substantial royalty revenue from Moderna, as do uh, six different staffers who have government salaries. They get supplemented 150000 a year uh, for royalties from their work that they did in engineering what we now call the Moderna vaccine. Wow. The, the Pfizer vaccine is based on BioNTech, which was similarly sponsored by the German government. Okay, so, so those, it's good to know that those are government sponsored companies. Right. And they're government backed with the PR push and everything else. So it's just helpful. 
In terms of the Operation Warp Speed uh, events that happened, OWS, Pfizer, Moderna kept their products basically outside OWS. They were competitors. Hmm. And the mRNA vaccine that was the focus of OWS is the Moderna product. The Moderna product dosing in terms of RNA is about three times that of Pfizer, three times higher. Wow. And when you look at the adverse event profile from the VAERS database as shown by CDC, some of their publications, the Moderna product is associated with higher and broader adverse events than the Pfizer product. And, um, and furthermore, the adverse events are more prominent with both of them with the second dose than with the first dose. So based on that, in general, if you have the option, I suggest that Pfizer is probably the way to go here in the States until Novavax becomes available, should it become available, because there was a decision apparently in HHS that these three vaccines were sufficient and we didn't need a more traditional vaccine like the Novavax product that's made in caterpillar cells using an adjuvant derived from tree bark. So uh, Novavax pivoted to a agreement with CEPI uh, to make this product more available on the international market. And I'm not even sure if it's going to be made available in the States. One hopes so, because there's about, you know, over 50% of the population right now are vaccine hesitant. And right. I think many of those would prefer a more traditional product than a genetic vaccine product. But I don't know if the government's going to make that a, a, an opportunity for us. Many countries do have more traditional vaccines. Often they're less effective for preventing death and disease. Although now we're seeing that um, the high effectiveness levels of uh, the currently licensed products, if we believe the Israeli data, um, is not as strong against some of these other variants like uh, Delta than they were against the original Wuhan strains. So um, the and there's, a, there's inside baseball about how OWS came up with the Moderna dosing, but basically it was decision-making by committee driven to consensus. It wasn't really so much science-based. And there's some recent work out that shows that you can get really good immune responses with the Moderna product at about one-fourth the dose um, with only a single dose, not two. Hmm. So I, you know, people ask me, what next? or uh, government officials occasionally say, well, what can we do? Uh, and my response is we can really look hard at dropping the number of doses and dropping the overall dose of uh, certainly the Moderna product. Uh, but that's all speculative. It's just, you know, like I said, inside baseball communications. And uh, for folks like you uh, in your listenership, um, we're kind of stuck with what the government allows us to have access to. My next question, Robert, is it, it's an interesting one because millions, hundreds of millions of people have received a dose, right? So the question becomes, yes, it's an experimental vaccination or vaccine. The question is, how can the governments, and I say governments because it's a worldwide issue, not just a Absolutely. North American issue, right? Absolutely. The governments turn around and say, well, we've decided we're not going to pass this as we're not going to approve this vaccination because it doesn't meet our, our requirement. After hundreds of millions of people have been vaccinated. You're dead on. Uh, politically, they can't do it. Right. And, uh, this, this gets back to the consequences of what I call the noble lie. And the logic, what, what we've really had happen here, by the way, this emergency use authorization strategy where we really don't collect data on the people in terms of the safety uh, during this phase, and we rely on this really kludgy antique database system involving self-reports where we can't, it, here in the States, because of HIPAA, we can't 
couple people's medical records with the report that exists in VAERS to be able to really get a rigorous hunt on, on whether or not those are just temporal associations or are they functional associations. And uh, with the, just to illustrate, with the Ebola vaccine, uh, what the government did is they used something called expanded access um, or expanded use access. And what that meant was that they created these massive clinical trial structures. And anybody that needed the vaccine would be enrolled in one of these open-ended clinical trials. And they would be, they would be treated as if they were in a standard clinical trial environment where their adverse events would be captured both uh, through solicitation that's, you know, ring, ring, call center. How are you doing? Um, did you have this, that, or the other thing? Right. Uh, and uh, self-reporting or unsolicited <clears throat> adverse events. And the government, in their wisdom, decided not to do this. And they were hoping that they could kind of cobble together a bunch of different databases from the military and other things. That hasn't worked out so well. And anybody that works with healthcare databases knows why. Because they all have their own little nuances in coding. This this is a tech problem uh, of harmonizing different databases, which most you know that are involved in com computer technology understand exactly how painful that is. Uh, and so doing this in a rigorous way has turned out to be overwhelming to the CDC, which is not staffed by armies of Atlanta computer scientists because they're all working, making, you know, 10 times the budget that CDC <laughs> would have, right? right. Um, working for big tech. Uh, so, uh, um, so that hasn't worked out so well. And uh, so they're in a position where uh, worldwide now, uh, these different databases are uncovering safety signals. Um, it seems almost daily and having to wrestle with the, the like I, what I call the noble lie, uh, which is embedded, by the way, someone recently on Twitter pulled out um, the Federal Register from 1984, uh, an auspicious year, in which uh, the government uh, clearly lays out that uh, for the, largely for the polio vaccine campaign, any information about uh, that, that raises concerns about the safety of that vaccine was to be suppressed, actively suppressed, circa 1984. And that has long been a public policy, as I mentioned, the noble lie, the idea that leaders and key uh, public decision makers, public health leaders and government officials are justified in lying to the public for the common good. And this is this is I I I'm not I haven't read Plato, but I've learned a lot over the last few months about these things, and this traces back to the work of Plato. Uh, so it's sometimes called the noble Platonic line. You can wiki it uh, and and find more than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> uh, but when you see the 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 communication, you know the emails disclosed in the Washington Post of senior government officials that I'll not name. Uh, um, openly admitting that they've been lying to the public, right. for the public good. This is grounded in a Platonic concept that it's okay to do that for the common good because people wouldn't accept vaccine should they actually know the full spectrum of risks. Right. And so that would, the logic is that anybody that discloses those risks or discusses those risks is causing people to die because they haven't accepted vaccine. And so that gets into this latest dirty dozen stuff about a list of people that have been identified as by the government as causing death because they are discussing vaccine safety risks. Hmm. So and this is happening worldwide. There are countries where physicians are being declared mentally incompetent for either raising these questions or uh, for uh, advancing or discussing repurposed drugs or alternative therapies for That's outpatients, hard. for instance, 
And some of these physicians are actually being institutionalized for their mental instability for having done so. And they're definitely losing their licenses or their ability to practice. So that's, that's what's happened, I think, here, if you'll forgive my venturing into this space. Please. No, please. We have the, this idea of enforcing the noble lie that goes back you know, clearly at least to 84, if not earlier, in public health. So this is kind of almost kind of a, a mid-century idea in American public health and worldwide. It's been carried forward through time without really being examined uh, logically. Does this really make sense? Is this a good idea in the modern age where everybody wants to Google everything and find out anything they can? And if it doesn't, if the pieces don't fit or they feel like they are being manipulated and the information is being manipulated, then they, they go into what I call Lego conspiracy mode there's all these little fragments of information like Legos that can be assembled to uh, your favorite conspiracy. And that is actively happening because this is how people's minds go. You know, intelligent, thoughtful people uh, are, are prone to, uh, if, if they're not given the straight information, they're prone to fabricate stories of their own uh, based on the little bit of information that they have. And that is actively happening and it's driving the government nuts. I think that this idea of the noble lie and restricting access to information and disclosure is antiquated. I think that's really what's going on hmm. is we've had this intersection of horizontally integrated capabilities for information control that are amazingly powerful that didn't exist even during the Ebola outbreak. Sure. So you've, you know, the trusted, if you want to look up trusted news initiative, it's not a conspiracy. It's actually a BBC press announcement, um, British Broadcasting Corporation. And there's this organization of, of major news media and tech like Facebook and Microsoft, et cetera, Google, that are integrated um, and were built as a system, an integrated system and consortium for purposes of resisting foreign disinformation campaigns during elections. And with the rollout of the vaccines last fall, there was a decision that this organization would be turned and used uh, for this purpose of the noble lie of suppressing any information that was contrary to the established narrative. So that's why your YouTube will be taken down if you talk about things like ivermectin or um, vaccine safety that um, are that involve concepts or discussion about information that is not consistent with the official World Health Organization party line or the CDC. And yet we all know, because we've lived it, that the CDC has flip-flopped multiple times, the WHO has flip-flopped multiple times, and other public health leaders that will be unnamed have flip-flopped multiple times and are actually quite open about it. They think that they've done it for a good, good reason. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's, you know, you get big tech and in the media all integrated. And now we have funding coming from Bill. This is all true. It's not a conspiracy. Absolutely. We have money coming from Bill and Melinda Gates and the Wellcome Trust that is flowing down and creating new pop-up uh, fact-checking organizations that are really applying what we would traditionally call psychological operations concepts to craft uh, public perception about all these issues and motivate the public to accept vaccine across all sec all age cohorts. Right. Uh, and and that's that's I think that what we really have, we, you know, there's a lot of people that go. In, down all kinds of rabbit holes about Davos and collusion and sure. uh, the grand scheme and the big reset and all this stuff yeah. and it just about a vaccine that you know I can't say that that isn't true I, I, I can't I don't know the data they don't invite me to Davos I haven't sat on those meetings I don't know that that actually happened right. but I can see the the uh, structures because it's all public for this information campaign that is integrated and the we have 
it's very open and transparent. We have interlinks between big pharma like Pfizer and the press. So the chairman of the board of Reuters sits on the board of directors of Pfizer. I mean, it's all integrated now. That's crazy. And, and it's incredibly powerful for information control. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's often, you know, any of us that work in tech at all um, understand algorithms. And, you know, I like to say artificial intelligence is the least intelligent of the various options there, right, down to deep learning, right? right. Artificial intelligence is like the big hammer. It just hits things. And uh, um, it, it's kind of stupid in a lot of ways. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that approach, and that's what we're dealing with is algorithm-based fact-checking where you're comparing statements that may be nuanced with uh, broad brushstroke statements that have been approved in the language approved by the World Health Organization or the CDC or the European Medicines Agency or, or fill in the blank uh, National Health Authority. And, um, and the, there's other subtleties to this that are fascinating, if you don't mind my going there. Absolutely, please. Both, both of our sons are computer scientists. Okay. And uh, um, fairly high end, even though they're young and uh, they make more money than I do. And uh, one of them who works for a company uh, based out of Atlanta that does, you know, distributes billions, literally daily emails and has all kinds of cool tools uh, that I won't name. Please. Uh, but uh, he, he had this conversation with us the other day about scattering cockroaches. And it's that metaphor is not very, uh, um, you know, it's not politically correct speech to use the metaphor of scattering cockroaches, but the concept applied to the Facebook decision to delete the uh, user groups that had been established to discuss uh, adverse events that people claim to have experienced about vaccines. Okay, yep. So they deleted uh, 150,000 people or something like that that were all chatting about their experiences mm -hmm. because they thought this was going to dissuade people from taking vaccines. When they did that, um, they essentially stomped on the cockroach nest or on the food that attracted them is the metaphor. And the cockroaches all scattered into other venues, uh, Reddit or whatever, you know, Instagram, sure. blah, blah, blah. Um, they were no longer aggregated in a single place mm. where the government could have data mined that quite successfully right. to provide signals that they could then apply statistically to the CDC databases because that's the core problem with analyzing these databases is multiple imputation statistically. You can't ask at a 95% confidence interval the broad question, hmm, is there any association of any of this stuff with vaccine? Because you get into a statistical trap when you do that and you end up just statistically with 5% of the stuff, if you have a 95% confidence interval, being false positives. And right. you end up chasing the false positives, and it's wicked hard to get down to the true positives if you take that type of approach. So statistically, what you have to do is you have to have a hypothesis, oh, I think that this is associated with cardiac events. And then you go looking for the testing the hypothesis, and then you run into other problems like masking and confounding, because if you have a high baseline of, say, cardiac events in the older population, you'll never see the new events that trickle in from vaccines. But if you have a low incidence of cardiac events, say, in adolescents, you can see that signal quite clearly. Okay, So it doesn't mean that it's not happening in everybody else. It just means right. you can't find it statistically. Right. Um, so that's, that's the kind of, now that we have this situation where we are um, sampling the worst possible type of data, self-reported that cannot be uh, associated or not associated, that under, it's previously, years ago, documented by a Harvard study that the VAERS database, this type of, of self-reporting results in an undercounting of about a hundredfold. Hmm. So when you see Steve Hirsch um, with whatever hair he has left uh, with his hair on fire, um, 
about the number of deaths in the VAERS database, which cannot be uh, fully attributed or, or ruled out as vaccine right. selected because of the structural problems. Um, what's really setting Steve's remaining hairs on fire is that, uh, I'm cheating Steve Kirsch in case he ever listens to this, uh, um, is that that's probably a 100 fold underreporting of the deaths. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, based on, uh, you know, previously peer reviewed published research. Sure. Uh, so, so we're in, you know, and as time goes by and what's happened is that the government, the governments worldwide have used these profoundly powerful tools of inf information control and population control in terms of uh, knowledge and bias to impose a bias on not just those that they wish to take vaccine, that there's no problems here. That same messaging and bias is, is runs all the way through the CDC. And the CDC has it as a mission that they should uh, comport with this overall logic that adverse events should not be openly disclosed, which is in direct conflict with federal rule and uh, you know the common rule and the Nuremberg Code and all that stuff. Hmm. Uh, but they, they believe they're doing it for the right reason. Uh, and that gets us to this weird situation we're in right now. And what's starting to happen is that um, is that that the uh, you know enough people are getting red pilled uh, that uh, they're starting all over the world, right. intellectuals in particular are starting to say this doesn't look right. Yep. And uh, now the government, as you say with your question, has got a problem, and they they can't lose legitimacy. Right. And yet. Um, a fun fact, it used to be that 1% of the population had self-identified as anti-vaxxers, and now it's over 40. Uh, and, you know, I put out twice, once on Twitter and once on LinkedIn, a comment, what happens to trust in, in public health if it turns out that ivermectin is has efficacy, not perfectly sure. effective, and sure. is safe, and vaccines are not perfectly safe? Which is the messaging we received, and yep. I those both those both those went viral. Uh, uh, LinkedIn for LinkedIn viral means twenty thousand people. Um, <laughs> Twitter, you know, millions. Uh, but uh, um, with just comment after comment after comment, we've already lost our tr faith in public health, in the WHO, the CDC. As I've said in other podcasts, what I'm concerned about is what happens after. And this basically, the, these people that had been labeled, gaslighted, pejoratively labeled as anti-vaxxers, it's a common mm -hmm. slander, um, now are being, their, their historic reservations about government integrity and the behavior of the pharmaceutical industries are being validated. Right. And, and I have people writing me and commenting all the time, I don't want my kids to take any vaccines now. Right. And so in this, I, I think that we don't have to go to, to the Davos uh, controlling the world uh, conspiracies. I, I think that the Occam's razor here is what we have is incompetence and groupthink yep. uh, compounded by the acceptance of these historic this historic logic of the noble lie and mapping it into a new technology and media space where the the tools for controlling information that are now perceived as increasingly authoritarian are amazingly powerful Absolutely. and people are waking up and seeing that maybe for the first time and saying Ooh, <laughs> This 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 doesn't feel right at all. Agreed. And and in the politically, you, you we didn't want to go pol political. What I find fascinating is that this is orthogonal 
to the typical, the classic left-right um, uh, axis. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, it is, the good news is, it's allowing, what I'm experiencing, it's allowing people that traditionally have been in opposition under this left-right axis to be interacting. Right. And, and establishing what they believe is the world that they want to live in and most of them are saying, no, we heard George Orwell loud and clear. And we don't want to go there. We don't want a ministry of truth. And we don't want uh, new speak, which is another way of saying politically correct, if you think about it. Um, and, uh, and we're not OK with uh, the, the, where the, I think the real, uh, where the rubber hits the road is uh, this forced logic of forced vaccination for infants through young adults and young adults returning to university that isn't supported by the risk benefit data. That was a long monologue. Thank you for letting me get it out. No, no thank <laughs> you. Do you believe that the government will, or the governments will kick the can down the road, so to speak, and approve the vaccine because they really don't have another choice. And on top of that, with companies making millions of these vaccines per day, I presume, right, in production, at what point do they look at the vaccine and go, okay, we have to modify this component and this component and change. It might be the same ingredient, if you will, in layman's terms, but the milliliters of it are just reduced, right? Right. So, so dose, dose adjustment, um, right. Or, or reformulation, right. The reformulation mainly like in terms of, because the governments are in a really bad position right now, as we've talked about now for quite a bit of time, and they're really not going to have much of an option to just FDA approve this and we move on and everything's good, but they can reformulate. So, uh, I have to be careful here because I have spoken with senior government officials on the Hill about okay. this problem. And, okay. and you, you're correct that we, I believe strongly, we need to approach it with empathy uh, and not as, as setting up yet another conflict, even though that's what the lo media loves is to set up a, a binary divide. conflict. Divide, um, divide, divide. Yeah. Uh, so um, how does the government get out of this hole? is the Please. part of that question. Um, and will they kick the can? Uh, the, 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 the poor soul who is right at the pressure point on this is named Peter Marks. And he's the head of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the FDA. And the rest of the world really does look to the FDA still as the premier regulatory agency. Unfortunately, the FDA has been very significantly compromised by regulatory capture from the very industry it regulates. This often happens in uh, American politics. USDA is a notable example. So, so Peter, <laughs> bless his soul, is right at the, at the fulcrum. And uh, I'm sure he's under enormous pressure uh, to approve because it would, it would reduce the pain of the government. The government, I think, has cognitive dissonance just like uh, many of us do, right? And uh, um, and cognitive dissonance is pain. So, how are they going to reduce their pain? Uh, I think, and I've suggested to senior government leaders that they 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 have the option to resort back to to standard protocol for the advisory committee on immunization practices, and rather than pushing the logic of universal vaccination, they roll out recommendations that are stratified by risk. So that's the first thing. And that they, I think a lot of people worldwide in their many court cases now prosecuting this. So this, you know, stay tuned. This is gonna get a little rough and ugly. Buckle your seatbelt. Hmm. Um, there are, uh, 
there's a logic that there uh, emergence neither emergency use authorization nor licensure market authorization should be granted for the pediatric applications and probably also should be excluded pregnancy uh, and maybe some others wow and that would allow uh, the government to take a modified limited hangout uh, referencing back uh, so uh, you get it. So yep. I think there are some modified limited hangouts here for the government that will allow them to save face and still maintain access to vaccine. There, I was on a podcast for two hours yesterday morning, starting at seven with an international group, and they wanted us all to agree to a consensus statement that the vaccine distribution should be halted at the moment. And, and I said, I can't sign off on that. Um, the risk benefit ratio for the elderly is there. And uh, furthermore, if you do that, I didn't say it, but it is, um, you're tilting at windmills. You're, you're, you know, this, this is uh, not going to get you anywhere. You've got to focus in my opinion on the things that you can win. Right. And I'm focused on trying to s protect infants and through young adults, I think that's a winnable thing. And I think it is solidly supported by data. And I think the, it, the government could get behind that and say, you know what, we've kind of rethought this and we look back at our policies and the data have changed and, and they, and, you know, and then there would be articles out in the Washington Post editorials saying, I think this is a great idea and in the New right. York Times and, and the Wall Street Journal. And we would all say, and everybody would turn around and say, sounds good. Off we go. Right. March, yep. March, March. Um, and uh, I think that um, they really should make Novavax available in North America uh, for those vaccine hesitant that are just uncomfortable with the genetic vaccine, which is like about half the population, um, and give them another option. And it's sitting there waiting for you. And if it means that you have to scale up production for Novavax, but even just saying that they will make Novavax available under EUA would take some of that political pressure off. Sure. And uh, the many people believe that there will be a decision to license the Pfizer product at least um, by, certainly by Christmas, if not sooner. You asked that question. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I, I tend to uh, concur that that is a likely outcome and uh it it but what's happening is that folks with deep pockets are aggravated enough about this that there you can buy for instance the whole medicaid medicare data package for the last two years for about twenty five thousand bucks hmm. and get access to all that data and do your own data analysis. And I know of people that are doing this and they seem to be discovering uh, that the uh, CDC is grossly underreporting many of these adverse events. Uh, it just based on the CMMS data. Uh, and that's when that comes out and it will, uh, the government is going to have a real problem and there there's going to be this is going to end up in the supremes i really? i i can't see how it doesn't this this mm. is if the government stays entrenched like this um they're risking major political blowback and legal blowback that it will tear apart the current public health system and are really already is mm. and uh i think we've got key constituencies politically in angry mothers, young adults. And by the way, the African-American uptake of these vaccines is about 20% mm -hmm. because they have this historic memory of Tuskegee. And Tuskegee is a CDC thing. And they really don't trust the government. Uh, you think that uh, the Ruby Ridge types don't. Uh, African-Americans as a block are pretty dug in that uh, they they don't like uh, a lot of things the government does in public health. So. Uh, those are three key constituencies that if alienated will um, transform the political landscape, gently put. Uh, and so where does this go? And, and you had these enormous 
protests against Macron in France with his mandate. The vaccine passport logic is a trigger. People, people just are going nuts over that. Absolutely. And uh, I, I just, it's, it's like the government, that's why I say it's groupthink. I think worldwide, um, a leadership has convinced themselves they, they want to come to consensus. They want to think alike. They want to be aligned. And I think they have gone down a rabbit hole. And it may be in part because they've been influenced by these mega donors that we don't need to name. We mentioned them earlier. And uh, I think those mega donors uh, have, have built up their own logic and are true believers in the vaccine strategy rather than kind of pragmatic, uh, which is how I try to approach it, of, of kind of open-ended, sure. hmm, what makes sense here, what makes sense there, and let's pick a little from this you know, Chinese menu approach. Yep. Uh, and uh, they're, they're all in on you know, vaccines is uh, the way to solve the world's problems. Right. And uh, they've, they've spent a ton of money influencing the World Health Organization and governments uh, to, to get with the program. In terms of alternative, I don't want to use the word medicine, but treatment, are you in agreement that vitamin D and zinc daily is a great way to combat this as well? Combat is a strong word. Okay. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm more in the reduce your risk camp. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, and absolutely. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, Likewise, the I think that my colleagues, uh, my valued colleagues, who believe so strongly in ivermectin uh, as as a solution, and some that I've been on a podcast with even believe that ivermectin can eradicate COVID um, and the virus from the population. They're they're not epidemiologists and virologists, and they and they aren't outbreak specialists and they don't know, um, you know, there's a lot of, of uh, internet experts out there. Uh, uh, the practicalities of, of doing something like this and the, the necessity of having an agent or a vaccine that is uh, incredibly potent, that can uh, knock virus replication uh, down to extremely low levels like we've done with HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, getting to the point where we had drug therapies that could control HIV and, and make it so that those that are infected have almost a non-existent risk of transmitting the virus to a third party has taken two decades. Um, ivermectin ain't it. Uh, it. It has activity, both as a prophylactic and a therapeutic. I'm convinced of that. Does that mean that it's the silver bullet? I'm convinced that it absolutely doesn't mean that. And does it mean that it is a extremely potent antiviral at safe doses? Absolutely not. Uh, so that's, you know, I'm, but the vitamin D and dinks, zinc story, there's widespread vitamin D deficiency, right? including myself. And I'm having to take fairly large doses. My cardiologist uh, is actively managing me as an elderly, you know, young gentleman. Uh, uh, and um, that's part of the supplements that I take. And you know, we can measure my vitamin D levels, and they're Absolutely. they're Same. not where they need to be, and and uh, they're getting there. Right. Uh, so that's that's just good medicine. Um, you know, taking care of our bodies, reducing our body weight, staying fit, um, and getting plenty of sunshine, and uh, making sure that the measurable variables that are associated with immune uh, competence are are where they should be. That's that's just good medicine. Um, in my opinion. Dr. Malone, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have and that or that you would like to say this is your time? Okay, so the concluding statement. Um uh I mentioned the noble lie that the noble lie has three elements to it. The first is that the way that we get out of this economic situation we're in because, of course, like I said, it's all about the money. Um, the way that we get out of this economic situation and reduce disease and death 
morbidity and mortality for COVID. The, the thesis is that the only way to do that is to reach herd immunity. The second part of the noble lie is that the only re way to reach herd immunity is with vaccination. The third part of the noble lie is that vaccination is perfectly safe. All of those are false. Okay, so um, there's, you know, drugs can help us with the disease and death. Sure. <clears throat> and the way that we usually get to herd immunity is through viral spread uh, of the natural infection. So there are those that call this natural immunity. Uh, and um, and the vaccines are not perfectly safe. We know that, you know, how, how safe or unsafe they are, we're still debating that. Right. <coughs> That's the first one. Second one, key point, is that um, the bioethics uh, here, foundation, has three components. So three and three, easy to remember. There has to be full and complete disclosure of risks. Those risks have to be comprehended. And you have to accept those risks if you are to accept, particularly an experimental product, of your own free will. You should not be coerced through public media management or anything else or free shotguns uh, to take vaccine. You should take it because you think it's the right thing for you, which puts the burden of responsibility on your shoulders, by the way. This is kind of a libertarian piece, this, this uh, common rule in bioethics. It's kind of grounded in the idea that your body is yours. It doesn't belong to the state. Right. And uh, so with that comes responsibility. And if you wish to abdicate that responsibility and not think about these things and just go along to get along, that's fine. Uh, that's your choice with your body. And uh, if there are downstream consequences, you will have to deal with them. And the, the liability protections are such that you can pretty much forget about getting any compensation if anything happens to you. So that's just the way things are. The third is a good news piece. I, uh, the, um, the history of virology is that as a virus enters a new population, a new species, it tends to be highly pathogenic very often. And that is the case here. Whether or not this was engineered in a laboratory, it crossed over from bats, it's kind of irrelevant. It's in the population right. in terms of this. And what happens is that over time, the evolutionary pressures on viruses in a population drive them towards becoming less pathogenic and more highly infectious. If you think about it from a virus's point of view, um, you don't want your host to go to bed or die. You want your host walking about, you know, talking to people and shedding virus and infecting other people. Right. So that's, those are the evolutionary pressures. And I suspect that we will get there that this virus will be in, is embedded and will be embedded in our population for the rest of our natural lives, for better, for worse. But it will gradually become more like a flu or a common cold. That's the hope. And that's the history of other viruses. The last point I'd like to close on is, is, a, is the Rodney King plea. Can't we all get along? Um, this... If we set up, if we go with what the media likes, the li media likes these binary oppositional relationships. It really sells papers. It's super good for clicks. You know, yeah. Great for advertising to say, um, you know, you're either anti-science or you're pro-science. You're either pro-vaccine or you're anti-vaccine. It, it misses the, the, the gray, all of this information in between but it serves their interests because they're not scientists. They're not uh, public health officials and they can talk about politics and give their opinion about the fight. Uh, they're horrible at understanding the nuances of what's going on, but it's really easy for them to do, uh, you know, the play-by-play uh, -play play of the baseball game and what inning we're in and who's winning. Uh, and they, they love to do that because it's something they can do and everybody can understand that. They don't have to spend time on their segment like we're spending two hours right. uh, just to get down to the basics. Uh, and, and don't play into that. What, what I like to say is we need to, to share with each other and, and have an open heart and appreciate as you do 
that the public health officials and, and your practicing daily physician who has spent all of his or her life, you know, professional life being taught to just do what the CDC tells you to do and don't think about it too much. And you're asking that person to say, to, to have, to ex process the cognitive dissonance of this crazy guy Malone and others like him, Dr. McCall and others, the dirty dozen, saying, hmm, maybe there's something going on here and we ought to pay attention and maybe, you know, we're, we're no longer in Kansas and everything is perfect uh, and, uh, and we need to live in the real world. Well, that doesn't kind of fit with what they've been taught to uh, go along with whatever the officialdom is telling them. Right. And, and so they're, they're having psychological pain and cognitive dissonance. The public health officials are in a bind, as you point out. Mm -hmm. And if we set it up as a fight, it will continue to be a fight. Correct. And if we approach it with open hearts and open minds as a shared dialogue, then I think we can move towards a s solutions that are um, suboptimal, not perfect, sure. but uh, more adaptive than what we currently have. So that's what I'd like to close on, if you don't mind. Thank you so much for taking all of the time. I really do appreciate it. It's um, fascinating to learn about a new billion dollar industry that none of us expected would come about. And I thank you for your work past and certainly present and look forward to hearing more from you. Thanks for your time and for this forum. Thank you so much, doctor. Thanks for listening. Find us on YouTube and Facebook at the Intellectual People Podcast and online at the intellectualpeoplepodcast.com. Check back for exciting new episodes.